Hi, welcome to How to D and D. My name is Fred Wheeler, and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons 5e because I always do. Um, I am a fan of MacGyver. For those of you who are confused by the image, I thought it was going to relate very nicely to this topic for today. The topic for today is the best adventuring gear items for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. I had initially decided I would put down the best 30 adventuring gear items for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. But there seems to be this thing right now on the internet where we have to have the best 5 or the best 10. And I really feel like that is kind of short-sighted with regard to the usefulness of Dungeons and Dragons adventuring gear. So uh, I don't know what to do with that. I'm really not too sure. Um, so I'm going to go with adventuring gear is really important. It helps you solve problems. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, they often overlook or ignore the usefulness of something like mundane items in their game. And players will be drawn to the flashy class features, spells, and of course, magic items. We all want magic items because they solve all problems. But you can do so much with just simple mundane adventuring gear. Now the thing is, I want you to share the adventuring gear amongst all the members of the party. Don't go and rely on your dungeon master or the adventure having a bag of holding or something that has a portable hole where you can store all of this stuff. Don't need to rely on the strongest individual or one character in the entire party to carry this stuff. Because the chances are you do not need to have duplicates of the same item for it to be useful for your party. Sometimes only one member needs to have the item and that's all you need to worry about. So I'm going to go through my list and it's long. Be warned, I have many things I want to talk about. I'm going to start off with number one. Rope. Rope for climbing down holes. Tying up your enemies. I mean, you can use rope for climbing up a cliff face or any kind of emban emban em emban I don't know, a cliff. Climbing up a cliff, let's just say that. Um, truthfully, when it comes to the selection of rope, hemp rope will probably be your starting point. But after that, look, you can honestly go with the silk rope because it's a bit more expensive later on, yes, but it's lighter and it's significantly lighter and that will be really useful to you as you collect more items in your pack or in various packs amongst your party members. I did a whole video on the topic of rope, if you didn't know, and yes, you can make a raft using bamboo or branches and rope and tie it all together and then go for a little trip down the, ra um, down the river. Okay, number two is the 10-foot pole. It's been around, it's kind of traditional in Dungeons and Dragons. It's kind of been overlooked a lot recently. There are, in fact, quite a few different things you can do with a 10-foot pole. Uh, it's really useful for checking for traps and, of course, pole vaulting over those pit traps or those uh, large gaps in the dungeon where you can't jump across easily, but a pole vault um, or a pole would allow you to do so. Of course, the pole needs to be the right length, so if it's not the right length and you don't have enough space above you, problems. Yes, I do realise that. Uh, the great thing about a pole, and one of my players brought this up just recently, <clears throat> I'm going to take a 10-foot pole thread, and I'm going to take mending, and then I'm going to break the pole into easily carable, um, carrying um, items, and then I'm just going to use mending on each break and fix it later on when I need it to be the full length. And I was like, all right, that's fine. That makes sense. I can live with that. <laughs> number three is chalk. I did a video on the 10-foot pole, by the way. Um, number three is chalk. It gives you extra grip. So you want to increase the grip that you're uh, applying when you're climbing or lifting something. It's really good for marking out the path that you're traveling. It can do a lot of different things. So take chalk. And I can't spell out enough just how useful chalk can be. You'd be surprised what other uses there are. Yeah, I did another video on that one as well, by the way. All right, number four is pitons. That's that strange sort of thing that climbers use. You can jam it into a door to keep it closed during a long rest so the monsters can't eat you. You can secure it to a rope um, when you're climbing. That's the whole purpose of uh, the piton, is so that when you're climbing, you uh, smash it in with a hammer 
uh, into a crack in a rock and then you secure your rope to that and then you continue climbing and then of course if you wind up accidentally falling you don't fall too far because the piton will support your weight and usually when climbing with a piton and a climber's kit if you want to have a climber's kit um, three pitons your first one you would expect might give way the second one is a backup and the third one is if the backup doesn't hold you so three pitons for each point that you are securing is usually the norm with regard to climbing not that your dungeon master or anybody in your game is ever going to really understand any of that stuff so you don't need to worry about it too much yeah i made a video on that one too um <clears throat> number five candles oh gosh if you hadn't figured out a lot of these items i've made videos specifically on how to use them um candles are really good allow you to see where you are going you can use them to perform a spell ritual you can use them to create molds um, and and don't forget with candles we have other types of light sources you don't necessarily have to use light in fact some of the better sources of light come from the use of a torch and a lantern which has a far greater range than a candle and some of the spells that you might want to use so remember candles now the great thing about a candle really cheap put it pretty much anywhere it was the normal uh, use um, of a candle in medieval times to light a location particularly when you were inside if you were outside not necessarily the case you want something a bit stronger otherwise candle light gets blown out but um, really good when you're indoors and of course you're going to spend a lot of time indoors number six is the scroll or the map case now that's used to store a map a scroll Oh my gosh, I didn't know that Fred. Yes, of course you knew this. But you can also keep paper dry. And sometimes when you're adventuring, you might find yourself being in the drink. And then when you're going swimming or you need to go somewhere else and you don't really want your map to be wet and then sticky and of course it sticks together and then gets destroyed. And if you've got a dungeon master who likes to sort of mess with you a little bit, then keep it dry, put it in a map case. Now the map case can be used for other items. Um, it can be used for a lot of different purposes. So, one of them being uh, casting light on a, a stone, chucking it inside the scroll uh, case, and then putting the lid on, and then taking the lid off, and putting the lid back on. Okay? It's like a torch. Not a particularly good torch, but certainly kind of like it. All right, number seven is the hammer. Who doesn't want to have a hammer? I'd, I want to have a hammer. I love hammers. They're great. Why? Because... I can use that to pound the piton into the rope. I'm not going to use my fist, okay? I'm not Jackie Chan. I'm certainly not Bruce Lee. So I'm going to need a hammer. Um, I can break an object with a hammer. Much easier to do that. And of course, you don't need to wind up worrying about your weapon getting damaged or broken if your dungeon master decides that using that particular weapon on uh, that box or chest is going to cause all sorts of problems to your weapon. Use the hammer. It's also great as an improvised weapon. Lots of things are, in fact. Uh, there's quite a few, in fact. All right, number eight is the, the block and tackle. Does anybody know what a block and tackle is? You know, frankly, I didn't really understand what a block and tackle was until I realized that it was basically you employ it and it is a, a series of pulleys linked together with like a hook. That's what it is. It's really simple. What is it used for? It's used for lifting very heavy objects. So when you as the group cannot move something, this can. You just need to set it up. You're going to use that piton that you, you, you had. You're going to grab that rope because you should have had that in your pack, pack as well. You're going to secure it up and then you're going to lift whatever it is in the way. Tie it around there, lift it up, and you're going to use the combined force of the entire party plus the fact that the block and tackle allows you to lift four times your... Um, lifting weight which is exactly what we want to do not only that a block and tackle would you believe it can be set up to drag something across the ground you don't necessarily want to lift it up maybe you want to drag it across the ground who used to do something like this i believe it was the egyptians building the pyramids they had a, a system very much like that okay <clears throat> number nine is flour it is great for creating explosions do not use flour for putting out a fire, okay? The dust 
is very, very fine, and when it gets in the air, it can create a whole lot of problems. You can also dust the ground lightly with uh, flour, and then it will allow you to hopefully detect invisible creatures that stand on the flour. Okay, as long as they don't fly, you can use it for doing that. I have done a video on how to use flour. You can use flour for making bread. I know that's not necessarily something you don't want to go Dungeons and Dragons um, adventuring. I'm going to make bread. Mm. No, but detecting invisible creatures and creating explosions and fire, that's what we're all about when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons. Absolutely. Let's do something like that. Okay, number 10 is fishing tackles can be used to catch fish to eat when you run out of rations. It's very simple. How often would you use this? Well, a lot of people might say, well, you won't use it very often. But if you're close to the sea, absolutely, you're going to use it a lot. If there's lots of streams and rivers, yes. You don't need to worry about continually buying rations from your, um, uh, your money source. You might be the sort of person who decides, I'm going to go hunting. Well, yes, maybe you're not a hunter, maybe you're a fisher. So another really good item for uh, taking adventuring. Next is number 11, and that is string. You can use string for many different things, but it's great for setting up a, a trip wire or line for a trap. And then, of course, whatever you attach to that is up to you, but a trip line is really, really useful for many different things. You can also use it for tying things together. I've even used it for laying out a path so I know where I've gone or as uh, tying off on a tree branch so I know that I've been past this location uh, before just in case the dungeon master is trying to get you lost or you're trying to get lost, one of those. Next is often overlooked and it's very, very light. It doesn't take up a lot of space and it's not really expensive and that's number 12 and that is the signal whistle or horn. If you don't like the signal whistle, we go with the horn you can blow that for emergencies, signal the party that you need help, or scare off wild beasts. In Boromir's case, it pretty much brought him to the end of his rope, and he wound up with far too many monsters heading his way. So just be wary of using the signal horn or whistle. In some cases, it could backfire on you. But if you have no other choice and you're already surrounded, you might as well blow on the horn so that somebody comes and helps you or at least carts your, your body away to be resurrected later on. Should that be possible, that is. Number 13 is the bag of caltrops. Scatter that on the ground and it will injure your pursuers when they stand on them. And if you put it in a very narrow passageway, that's likely to happen because they won't have any other choice other than to jump across it. Now, you want to carry more than one bag of caltrops if you can. And it would be sensible, since they're not particularly heavy, that everybody has a bag of these things. It also creates difficult terrain to move across because, of course, you've got to sort of do the, the dainty ballerina dance as you try to get past them. Caltrops, really, really useful. So make sure you have some of those. Next, number 14, is the bag of ball bearings, which is often considered to be one of the most useless pieces of equipment in the Dungeons & Dragons adventuring gear section. As Marisha Ray has illustrated on numerous occasions while playing in the uh, Critical Role uh, live stream. But this isn't really because of what Marisha Ray was trying to do, I think that's fairly more likely uh, a case of the Dungeon Master and Marisha Ray, that is Matt Mercer and Marisha Ray, not really having an understanding around ball bearings and how they can be used in the game, and therefore every situation they came up in didn't sort of result in a particularly good outcome. But the great thing about a ball bearing is it's small, it will go into a small gap, you can stick it into a lock or a couple of these things and jam up that lock so nobody can stick the key in there, unlock it while you're trying to escape. That's what you want to do, right? If you've got the key and somebody's going to pursue you and there's a second set of keys, you're going to lock the door behind you, chuck in a couple of ball bearings so they can't get their key in there and then run away. Uh, it also creates difficult terrain and it can be used to actually move things. If you can get the ball bearing under a hard surface, if there's a hard surface on the ground and a hard surface that it's sitting on, 
then you can actually use those ball bearings to shift something around. Would you believe it, you can do the same thing with something as cheap as just little stones. Okay, what about number 15? And yes, I did a video on ball bearings too. Um, number 15 is the glass bottle with the cork. Uh, you can store liquids in it. Oh yeah, all right, I didn't know that one. You can use it as a musical instrument. So if you're a bard and you've kind of liked the idea of blowing into a bottle, then go with it. Um, you can also use it as an improvised weapon and a rolling pin. And frankly, uh, for those of you who are kind of confused by the glass bottle concept, you can send messages with it. I did a video on the topic. In fact, the gods must be crazy for even allowing this thing to exist at all uh, on, uh, on your Dungeons and Dragons world. Next is number 16, chains. Chains make a great improvised weapon. You know, whether you swing this thing around your head whether you are uh, wrapping it around your arm to provide you with some protection and use it like a shield, or whether you're wrapping it around your fist so you've got a knuckle duster, it's still really useful. Now, if you're going diving and you need to sink very quickly, um, a chain around your, your waist makes a great diving belt. It's also super useful for bait for rust monsters. Rust monsters aren't necessarily interested in eating you. No, they're not really interested in killing you, but they will rust your stuff. So throw them this and run away rather than throwing them any of your precious little daggers that you don't really want destroyed or your sword or your axe or shield and armor and that sort of stuff. So great for baiting that, uh, that rust monster. Okay, the bell. Number 17 is the bell. You can tie this to your trip line because you brought string with you, right? and you create an alarm system around your campsite. Even if the bell could only be used for that, how often do you create a campsite in Dungeons and Dragons? All the time. You'll use the bell and the string a lot. So it doesn't have to be a big bell, just a little bell, just a little itty bitty, bitty bell, one that moves, even if it's moving because the, the wind is blowing. Who cares? At least it's keeping you awake. All right, number 18 is sand. Throw sand in your enemy's eyes. It will blind them. You get advantage on attacks. Super simple. How long will it take them to get the sand out of their eyes? Probably quite a while. Long enough for you to do some damage to them. So yes, sand, and you can get it where. How much does sand cost? Go down to the beach, collect some, and you're done. So yes, get some sand. Number 19 is the Healer's Kit. This gives you automatic success on a medicine check to stabilize a dying creature. Anybody can use this thing. No dice roll required. All you do is you use your action and it works. And there are 10 uses in a kit for 5 gold pieces. Why do not why don't I see this in uh, a player's character sheet more often? Why do people forget to take this? I do not understand. Um, this is a beef for me. Um, I've talked about the healer's kit too many times, so I'm going to go on. I'm going to move on, otherwise I'm going to get stuck. All right, number 20 is the mirror, the steel mirror. It can be used to look around corners. It can be used for shaving. I'm only kidding. Um, of course it can be used for shaving. No, but it can be used for determining if a vampire is trying to set you up. If you're worried about the Medusa turning you to stone or the um, Basilisk, then make sure you have a mirror because it's going to help you so you can see them without winding up turning into a hard piece of rock. So mirrors, very useful. Next is number 21, the oil flask. Who never takes oil? Everybody takes oil. You should be taking oil. You should be taking more than one flask of oil. It's great for burning stuff. I love burning stuff. Who doesn't love burning stuff? It's great as a lubricant if you need to squeeze through something like bars or out of manacles. Of course, if you're in manacles, the chances are you won't have grease and that means you probably won't have the oil flasks. So that's kind of problematic, but still really good for getting somebody else out of manacles if you can't uh, break the manacles or you don't have any way of uh, disabling the lock. You can also use 
an oil flask to lubricate a, a squeaky door hinge. Now squeaky door hinges will alert somebody, but you can also cover yourself in oil. How hard is it to grab somebody who's covered in oil? I imagine it's like trying to deal with a sumo wrestler. Wouldn't be very easy at all. Very, very difficult. So make sure you have oil, just for the sake of burning stuff. Okay, number 22 is the sack. You can use it as a mask and hide your face. Make sure you cut some um, eye holes, otherwise you won't be able to see anything. It's great for storing stuff. If you're the sort of person who likes to cut off the heads of monsters and you've got to put them somewhere, don't put them in your pack, put them in the sack. Um, you can also use it to cover your enemies' heads while you're interrogating them so they don't know who you are and wind up going to the authorities and telling them you've been a bad boy or girl. So yes, absolutely make sure you have that sack ready and available. And it can do a lot of other things. We can go into clothing, but um, I don't have a clothing line for um, for sacks yet, so we'll, we'll come back to that some other day. Okay, number 23 is sealing wax. Sealing wax is kind of like the wax from a candle but it's got a different consistency different purpose it's great for making a key mold so that you can duplicate the key and then use somebody else's key to get through a door you need to get through particularly if the the, the lock is really complicated and you can't just pick that lock it's great for sealing a door a window a letter or a document so you know that somebody's been through that location in the past because that's why you have the the sealing wax and then you have the seal that you press into the sealing wax to indicate that you have just sealed it. If it's broken it will be obvious because you're the only one with the, the stamp for the seal. Okay, number 24. Oh, it's a favourite of mine. Number 24, uh, soap. Man, it's like we've gone shopping or something. Um, have we just walked down to the local supermarket to go shopping? Yes, we have. Uh, soap is flammable. It burns. And you know how I feel about burning things. I love it. So, um, it's flammable. It means you can make things burn. It also acts as a lubricant, much like oil, but slightly different consistency. And it can clean things. Now, whether that's clean your character or clean your clothes or whatever, I don't, I mean, I don't care. But it's got plenty of really good uses. And I did a video on that one too, I think. Um, all right. Uh, number 25 is the water skin really obvious it stores water you will need water to drink and even better for those of you here who are, are not uh, privy to this particular piece of information uh, water skins are much better at storing wine um, and you should always have a supply of wine with you when you go adventuring because you'll be subjected to all sorts of trauma and problems and as a result of that you will need to drink Okay, so that's your character, that is. I'm not talking about you. Um, okay, next is number 26, and that is the, the flint and steel, or the good old uh, tinderbox. This is basically a piece of striking steel and a bit of flint, and you strike it, and it makes fire. Again, like nothing can go wrong with fire. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, lots of things can go wrong with fire. But fire is good for lots of different things. It is essentially what has taken uh, humankind out of the dark age was the creation of fire because they could do so many things with it. You can heat things with fire. You can burn things with fire. Um, you can cook with it. You can make tools with it by melting things down and adjusting things. So fire, really useful. You've got to start with that. Flint and steel, the tinderbox. All right. We get in there, oh my gosh, will I pass out? Will you Will you survive? I do not know. Uh, number 27 is the whetstone. Shock horror for sharpening your axe, your swords, your blades, your arrow tips. That is just the basic concept of a, uh, a whetstone. Now, why would you want to do that? Chances are your dungeon master has said to you on numerous occasions when you have killed the monsters and tried to take their weapons and they say, oh, they're kind of blunt and, you know, they're a bit rusty and they don't look like they're in very good shape. Well, get out that whetstone and clean them up that way and they'll be good as new in no time. Uh, that's what the whole point of the whetstone is in the first place. Of course, if you don't want to go and buy a whetstone, I believe that a river stone, the smooth river stone with water, was often used as a way of sharpening blades. 
And in fact, you probably won't need to carry that necessarily around with you. You might very well be able to find that as you're traveling. Maybe an item you don't actually need to put in your pack. Okay, number 28. I see this come up all the time, and that is the crowbar. For prying open those doors, those windows, those lids, those hatches, to get into places you should not be going. Okay, this is what we do in Dungeons and Dragons. We're constantly going into places. Sometimes we're supposed to be there, but often we're not supposed to be there, and that's what a crowbar is all about. Okay, prying things open. Gives you advantage on that strength check. You're going to need it. Why would I need to use something like advantage? Well, because the chances of success increase, and um, my dungeon master's probably only going to let me make that check once, and that'll be it. So I might as well make sure I have a crowbar. Yes, everybody should have a crowbar. Okay, number 29, the grappling hook, tied to a rope, silk rope preferably, hemp rope if you have nothing else. Now the idea behind the grappling hook is to snag a rock outcrop, or basically allowing you to climb up things. We're going Batman here. If Batman has a grappling hook, why don't you? Uh, simply, it's really simple, everybody says, oh, but I've got a rope, and I want to climb up the, this, this cliff. And I will say to them, like most of your dungeon masters are probably saying is, yeah, but um, you have to climb it first. Do you have a grappling hook to snag an outcrop from a rock or um, try to jam it and throw it into a, 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 over a wall so you can pull on it? If you don't have a grappling hook, then the rope's not very useful to you unless you're going straight down a hole and you're tying it off at the top and just climbing down. If you want to go up, you need the grappling hook. Otherwise, if you're not going to use a grappling hook, you're going to have to go with that climber's kit. Or be really good at climbing, and um, good luck with that. Okay, number 30, and yes, this will be my last one, is the acid vial. Why do we want an acid vial? Because it does things that fire can't do. It burns and melts through something like a lock, iron bars. It can also be used as an improvised throwing attack. And that's really cool too, but the, the big bonus to this is portcullis, acid vial, I'm going to get through there. Because of course the portcullis bars are going to be too narrow. Jail bars, too narrow, acid vial. Need to get through a lock, couldn't un, um, pick the lock, don't have the key, can't smash the thing open, acid vial. Solution, acid vial. Okay, alright, so I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover. But the truth of the matter is, there are so many good pieces of adventuring gear that are mundane, that anybody can buy, that anybody can really carry with them. And yes, there are limitations on how much you can carry, but you should spread it amongst your... Just spread it around. You don't all have to carry the same thing all the time. Okay? This is just a small range of options that are available to you. And there are more that I could talk about, but if I did, you'd probably freak out. Okay, so each item is really only limited by your ingenuity and your ability to watch more of my videos on this topic, since I've done so many videos on how to use adventuring gear. Um, I, I can't even count how many have I done, there's been a lot. So yes, be ingenious, be creative, take mundane gear. Now, if you found this video helpful and useful, well, guess what? I have a lot of videos on how to use this stuff, and you're welcome to go and check it out. But I also have videos for players and dungeon masters on different topics regarding Dungeons and & Dragons and Dungeons & Dragons 5e. You can go and check those out if you want. If you want to support the channel so I keep doing content like this, well, guess what? You can do that by watching my videos, because I get AdSense revenue off of them, provided you're not going to an ad blocker. I also have a Patreon page, you can support me there. I have affiliate links to the book depository and Amazon, you can support me there. Uh, I also have a merchandise shelf where you can buy merch basically, and uh, that helps out the channel as well. Otherwise, just make sure to share, like and subscribe, hit the bell button to be notified when I go live and when I publish new videos, and hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.